Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, the North Ward Center, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Um, we do a series uh, where we talk to great teachers, exceptional educators. It's part of the uh, classroom close-up partnership we have with the uh, New Jersey Education Association. And here's one right now. He is uh, Drew Holmes, architectural design teacher, Atlantic County Institute of technology. Now you are a former architect? Landscape architect. And you shifted into education? Yes. Because? I wanted to do something a little different. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because? I wanted to try to help people. I didn't really feel like I was helping anybody doing what I was doing. I was designing a lot of casino stuff and uh, at the end of the day you would say you might beautify something, but you just didn't really feel like you were doing anything. How long have you been teaching? Uh, 15 years. Love it? Love it. Well, it's interesting. I mentioned the uh, New Jersey Education Association and the Classroom Close-Up series, which is you can see uh, on New Jersey's public television station, NJTV. And um, we've been working with the NJA on this series where we feature great educators. And what we do is we show a clip that you're about to see right now, and then we have this conversation with the educator. And this is a clip from Classroom Close-Up that uh, features Drew and his work, and then we'll come back and have a conversation. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna organize up into our groups. Architectural go design through. teacher Drew Holmes, along with dozens of students from the Atlantic County Institute of Technology, started this outdoor classroom project back in 2012. Over the past two years, ACIT students designed and actually built every landscape feature and structural component for this classroom. When they're designing something that they can actually see built, it's a different ball game. I gave the students a little assignments. I said, I want you to design a desk. And uh, another student came up with a multi-seater desk you see here. Then those students got together with the carpentry class and then redesigned the desk. The carpentry class took the design and went with it. So it was, what was neat about it was to watch the kids get involved. On the day of our visit, many of the finishing touches were being completed. So what we're doing right now is we're nailing um, these trims on the bottom of the desk, so it holds the books, the textbooks, the notebooks, pencils, anything like that, so it doesn't all fall, it has some type of support. All right, what I want you guys to do, start grabbing these and you're gonna lay them out in rows. Art students also played an important role in this cross-curricular project. It began as a two-dimensional idea in paper and then we're developing it three-dimensional to kind of mirror the nature around. The idea is that not only art students, engineering, but even other students, or even a teacher, if you happen to be here, they can pick up the color and they can begin drawing and then painting it. Okay, guys, this is how it's gonna go. We're gonna bring it up, you guys are gonna come in. Chris Padula and his carpentry students designed and built many of the features, including an ADA-compliant desk. Okay. Standard work surface is 30 inches, so we're right there. 
We want the English classes to come out here and be inspired to write poetry and essays and be out in the fresh air. Our physics classes can come and calculate the angle of the sun by measuring shadows against trees. We have art classes that come out here and obviously being inspired. My life science classes, we can come out here and do ecological studies. In any class, it could be applied. And I think it's just relaxing to be out here instead of being so confined all the time. My father was one to say to me, goal, plan, schedule. Write down your goals. What do you want? What's going to make you happy in life? Once you make that decision, that's the goal you want, you got to go for it. And you'll say, hey, you know what? I, I learned something from that. How much do you love what you do? I enjoy getting up and going to work every day. Now, what was that like? I mean, by the way, let's uh, give credit. That program, you just, I asked how many students you had there. You said, about how many? Probably about 100 were out there that day. And part of the reason you were able to do that is because you got a grant from? Lowe's. Actually, Mrs. Hanna, the environmental science teacher, her students, and they got together and wrote a $10,000 grant. And out of, I believe, 30 schools applied for it, we were the ones that were accepted. Ms. Hanna? Mrs. Hanna, Ms. yes. Hanna, She's give her the credit for that. Phenomenal teacher. Phenomenal. So what are these students? In this outdoor environment, which is just, I talked about how hands-on you are right there and how much they seem to be into it. What are they walking away with? Well, they're learning basically how to work with other groups of people, where in a typical class, you're working in a, a classroom environment. Like my students were able to, they were given the ability to design something and sit down with the carpentry class. They'd say, change it up a little bit, redesign it and then go back and then build it and then review it with them. It was, pretty, it was a pretty neat process to watch the whole thing unfold. What's an arboreum? An arbor a collection of plants. I, I got the idea because I, I went to Rutgers. I went to Cook. And, you uh, too? I went to Rutgers. Yeah. Yeah. You tell people it's an Ivy League school? Uh, well, I've gotten... Because I stopped doing that recently. I got caught. I, I got in a couple <laughs> arguments. My brother lives in California, and he's constantly has to explain it to him. Yeah. They got that, that Stanford school out there? Yeah. yeah, never mind. Nothing. Uh, go ahead. So this whole arboreum, what, why is it so important to the initiative? Well, f first, we took out a, a few plants. And the, the idea came to us was because my superintendent, Philip, Philip Gunther, came to us and said it had an area that he wanted to uh, come up with an idea of what we could do with it. And so what I was thinking about the Pinelands and yeah. teaching the students about the Pinelands and I wanted them to understand the regulatory process and how I could bring that into the classroom. And I sat down with Mrs. Hanna and I said, we've got this, we put our eye, heads together and that's what we came up with. And then I went and talked to Joel Mott from the Pinelands and he came in and that's how we started the process. And uh, actually, the reason why is because I have a great superintendent, Philip Gunther, and then Ron DeFelice is my principal. Well, He's you are dropping a lot of names that are going to score you a lot of points. Well, I don't know if I'm trying to score points, but they basically, <laughs> as an educator, w what happens is... you got to uh, collaborate. You need these people. You have to have... If you don't, if you don't have these people, you're in trouble. You know, just, I was going to ask you a leadership question that I ask people. What's the greatest leadership lesson you learn? Is it working with other people? Definitely. You have to know how to work with other people. Yep. And you have to lead by example. You know, and sometimes it's tough. You know, sometimes it's tough in the classroom to lead by example. You know, because you have kids coming at, at you with a lot of different things. You know? It's so interesting. You're very physical in what you do. And, and uh, pull back on a shot, guys. You've got a uh, bicep tendon tear, right? Which I tell you, I happen to unfortunately know that injury. You're not able to use your right arm the way you would like to. How much does that affect your teaching? Uh, it's, I, I banged it yesterday. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, I, was, I banged it on the desk yesterday, and I actually went to the doctors on the way up here this morning. Point is, you need every part of your body to do what you do. Definitely, and you can see I move my hands a lot. So when I'm communicating, I don't know if it's from my, my mother or my father. What are you trying to say? Your family is somewhere from Italy? Is that what you're saying? No, not from <laughs> Italy, but that's just, they're, they're from Ireland. Well, so. either way, yeah. you are a great teacher, an educator who deserves to be recognized, and uh, we're um, very pleased that you joined us. Keep doing what you're doing, and we thank you and all the educators out there. Thank you. 
Stay right there. Drew Holmes, um, who is an architectural design teacher at Atlantic County Institute of Technology. Stay right there. One on one will continue right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Glenn Pomerantz, Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Good to see you, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Steve. Doctor, um, let's talk about molecular medicine. What is it? Sure. And why is it so important to the discussion about cancer? Well, let's start with people hear terms precision medicine, personalized medicine, targeted therapy. And all these terms have the same concept behind them. And that is that diseases today, as we understand them, are really issues of the gene. And of the, the gene? Of the gene. The gene is that mole molecules of hereditary that are the blueprint for a human being. So, so when it comes to cancer, I mean, you told our producers that in many ways, cancer is about the genes. I'm thinking, no, it's about the tissue, right? Isn't it? Right. Isn't it that why we're looking for? Well, yeah, when I was in medical school, I, 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 that's what we were taught. And that wasn't correct. So when, when cancer therapy was first, you know, the, the miracle of, of cancer treatment, of chemotherapy, mm. was to use chemical agents to kill rapidly dividing cells. Right. And we thought that agents that treated breast cancer would be different from agents that treated lung cancer, for instance. And now we know today the human genome was sequenced in 2001. Say that again. The human? The human genome, those are all the genes that make up the blueprint to build a human being. Okay. We, we sequenced that in 2001, so 14 years ago. Prior to that, we did not sequence the human genome. We did not have that done. So once that was done, then we found mutations within those genes that are directly related to certain cancers. And we understand now, in the last five years, that treating these mutations, these genetic mutations, has a profound impact on surviving cancer and specifically cause certain cancers. Wow. Um, I'm actually, as a layperson, trying to comprehend what you're saying, as I'm sure our audience watching right now is as well. Help us understand, as best you can, given what we know right now, Doctor, what are the potential implications of that in terms of A, treatment, B, potential cure? Right. Well, let, take, let's take lung cancer. Sure. Okay. If you have advanced lung cancer, stage four metastatic lung cancer, your survival, your chances, if you're diagnosed with that today, is 1% at five years. One out of 100 people are alive at five years. If we can identify one of the seven altered genes that are associated with lung cancer today, and we give you a targeted biological bullet to hit that protein produced by that abnormal gene, you can survive years now. Wait a minute, hold on. That means the protocol based on the gene-related information that you would have today that you would not have had here before, how many years ago? Well, even, even five years ago. Okay. You're saying that the protocol would be different, therefore the potential outcome would be different? Exactly, exactly. With lung cancer? With lung cancer, yeah. Is it true for other cancers as well? Well, we're seeing similar patterns. So that, you know, myself as an administrator, as a health insurer, I'm interested, in, are, are my members getting the right diagnostics? And then are they getting the right targeted treatments for the results of those diagnostic tests? So today, if you have lung cancer, you want to be tested, again, for those roughly seven altered genes that are associated with causing lung cancer. And there are, are curves now, and you can see this very clearly in studies that we've looked at, where if you, get the tar if you have the gene, the altered gene, and you get the targeted therapy, you can live years longer. And it can give people hope and promise they never had before. So, Doctor, uh, for people who are hearing this right now, are you advocating that patients go in and have conversations with their doctors armed with this information and say, look, I want to be tested for certain things. I want 
to have certain, I, I want to know what my options are given the fact that science is where it is today. Is, am I getting this right? Y yes. So. I don't know how that conversation goes, but... Yeah, I mean, well, it, it really depends on, on which cancer you have. Once you're diagnosed by the tissue biopsy, which cancer you have, there are certain genetic tests you should have. And if you don't have them, it really can profoundly decrease your chances at survival. But have the... Say it again, the genetic test? But, you know, certain genetic tests... Have it. Have it. Someone says, ah, I don't... Someone says, I don't want to know. That would be a mistake. Because? then you would not have the option there it is. Of, of treatment that can prolong your life, not months, but years, and potentially keep you alive for a cure. What is COTA, CODA? CODA is a big data a software company, actually uh, a company uh, that uh, came about right here in New Jersey, of uh, leading academic oncologists from Hackensack University Medical Center, Dr. Andrew Pecora and colleagues, yeah. uh, biostatisticians, and software engineers, and what they did is they solved two problems for us. The first thing is, as we're moving from a fee-for-service environment in healthcare, meaning that when you come see me as a doctor, I get paid for doing something, seeing you in the office yeah, for a fee visit, for service. seeing you in a consult in the hospital, performing surgery, I get paid. My payment is not linked to how you do. You could do well, you could do poorly. I still not get, based on outcome. Not based on, I still get paid. The country, the government, uh, CMS, the federal government, is moving to our system as we are in the commercial insurance industry to a value-based system where we're going to link reimbursement to outcome. And the problem is that right now our claim system is that we can't differentiate and we really can't tell how patients are doing outcome-wise. CODA solves that problem. It groups similar patients together. So if you have breast cancer and you have local breast cancer stage 2, you have a survival of five years of roughly 90%. If you have stage four, advanced metastatic breast cancer, your survival is about 20% in five years. Well, you shouldn't loop, uh, rather, you shouldn't group those patients together. They're different groups. CODA sorts those patients by groups and can report back to the doctor and to companies like mine how those patients are doing. It also can benchmark for doctors how they're doing against their peers, saying, you know, what is my rate of utilization of, of these tests? How are my patients doing in terms of their overall quality of life? More outcome driven. How are they doing in terms of their, um, just their, right, their quality of life, their functional status, toxicity to drugs? Last question, I want to ask you this about, um, I don't know if I should use the word cure, but and push back if I'm wrong. Sure. Am I correct that you have said that you believe that it is possible in this century? Right. We are at a tipping we point. We are. And the reason is, if you look at, we talked about, we sequenced the human genome in 2001. The cost of doing one gene on one laboratory platform in about 2005, 2002, was a, cost $100 million to do one gene for one person. In 2011, we can do 200, and now we can do 18,000. Wow. And the cost has gone from $100 million to about $4,000. You believe it's possible in this century? I do. And we can speed it up. I think insurance companies have a role to play here by setting up the reimbursement models that allow doc doctors to practice the art without being so confined by all these protocols that we put in place. Dr. Glenn Pomerantz, who is Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Horizon Blue Cross, Blue Shield of New Jersey. An extremely important conversation. Thank you so much. Stay Thank right you, Steve. There. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Shafiq Rabb is Chief Information Officer, Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you for welcoming me and bringing me to your studio. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we call patient-driven technology. What are we talking about here? Well, you know, uh, we're all trying to change healthcare. We're all trying to bring the cost of the healthcare down, and we're all trying to improve the outcome of the healthcare. But the only person who can change their healthcare is the patient himself or herself. And 
as uh, technology has changed, that means we have cloud technology, right. we have mobility, and we have better internet now. So what it does is that it allow, what we are talking about is giving the power in the hand of the patient to change his or her healthcare by being a participant in the healthcare. And also having the control in their hand. That means in the olden days, the doctor used to tell a patient to do something. Nowadays, what we are really trying to make sure that the patient has the right information at the right time with the right alert so that he or she can take action. How do they do that? Well, for example, if somebody, I'll give you a simple example. If somebody has diabetes and they have a pump on the side and all of a sudden their sugar goes down, which is hypoglycemia, the pump alerts the iPhone, iPhone or any kind of a, a smartphone, tells the patient, hey, your blood sugar is down. That communicates with the car GPS and the car GPS start driving. Takes you to a local place, there are three food choices. Either you can get a healthy food or a fatty food or a good food that you like. Stops the car, you go inside, you look at the food with a glass. The glass taste tells you the right portion of food to eat. You eat it and you become glycemic. You see? Yes. From the time that means, or if you take another example that people can understand, is that we want you, somebody has had a heart attack and they need to do exercise. So there is an app that tells you you gotta walk certain miles and your doctor has prescribed that to you. Like doctor prescribed drugs and medication, now doctor prescribes apps to you. And you walk about half a mile and you stop walking. Yes. There's an alert that goes back to the doctor's office who sends you a text, my dear friend, complete your mile. So that's a motivation that allows you to do that. So that's interesting because um, I've said this before, but I, I do a lot of communication training and coaching and, and I've done some work up at Hackensack and that's why I learned about this app and talking to Bob Garrett, um, the CEO of the entire Hackensack system. We were he was telling me about this app and I said, well, how does this app work? And obviously you're the chief technology officer and your, your team is developing it. And I actually was having a hard time understanding it as was the first thing explained to me. But as I understand it now, get, help me if I'm wrong, this is a communication system. Is it between the patient and the doctor, but also between doctors and doctors? That is correct. So um, here's how it, it goes, works through. A patient comes to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, uh, my dear friend, uh, you have a condition in which you should take this medication. You should monitor your blood pressure. You should monitor your... Is it all in the app? Is it absolutely, saying all that? Absolutely. So the doctor writes an order. Let me walk you through. Doctor writes on the electronic health record. Got it. That goes, communicates... Who else gets that information? The patient and the doctor. That's it. That's it? That's it. How do we know that? Oh, because it's secure? It, it's secure. It's totally between the EHR and the app and the doctor, nobody else. EHR is electronic health, record. health rec record. No one else gets that. Absolutely Okay, not. go ahead. And so when, the, when that order goes in, and for example, uh, on the iPhones, you have Apple Health Kit, so which is integrated with it, and then the patient gets up in the morning, stands on a weight, that weight transmits through the Wi-Fi into the phone, <laughs> from the phone into the electronic health record, and, and then the patient sees one thing. Here's the, here's the good thing, that the patient sees on the phone three things. If he has exercised, if he has taken the drug, and if he has been compliant with his food intake, he sees that his blood pressure is maintained. The day he misses his drug, his blood pressure goes up. The day he does not do the exercise, the day goes up. So the patient has an interaction and a correlation that allows the patient to motivate himself or herself to get better. And is the, the, okay, but the doctor, the information is valuable, but the doctor, I mean, he or she has to be monitoring the inf information and then reaching out, like, so say I, I'm, I'm working, I have the app. Yes, sir. And my cardiologist is, is, has the information, but I don't exercise today. I don't take my medication and my blood pressure is going up or I don't even test it. My cardiologist, I mean, he or she, He's got to be saying, hey, Steve, what's up with you today? Absolutely. But that's only as good as the monitoring system, right? So here's how it goes. Uh, every doctor or every place that we have at Hackensack, we have a 
group of people trying to take care of the patient. Yes. Whether we have the nurses behind it, whether we have the care coordinators behind it. So we have a monitoring system and an alert system. And we also set it in a way like the following. Suppose somebody has congestive heart failure, which is a condition in their heart. Sure, if you, a minute and, left, go ahead. Yeah, and people get a little, they, they gain their weight. Yes. So it's a predetermined alert that tells you, hey, suppose your weight goes by one pound. Not too much. Right. So five pounds, seven pounds. Yeah. And so there's a there is a sequential uh, consequence for that. So if it goes by three pounds, you can start chatting with your nurse. If it goes by five pounds, you might have a video visit with the doctor. And if it's fifteen pounds, maybe we should send an Uber to your home to bring you to the <laughs> hospital. This changes everything. Absolutely. 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 This is amazing. Um, Dr. Shafiq Rab, who is the Chief Information Officer at uh, Hackensack University Medical Center. We're talking about electronic hospital records. We're talking about patient-driven technology. We're talking about a whole new way of uh, dealing with healthcare. Thank you, doctor. Important stuff. Good stuff. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, the Northward Center, PSE&G, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Verizon Communications. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green, solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey. <laughs>